our thyroid gland plays a major role in the metabolism, growth, and development of the human body. So when things go wrong with your thyroid gland, it can have systemic effects. Hypothyroidism is where the thyroid gland doesn't make enough thyroid hormone. And the most common reason for this is an autoimmune disease called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. The internet is awash with all sorts of dietary advice for how a person with hypothyroidism should eat to treat and even cure this condition. In this podcast, I'll explore the claims made about diet and hypothyroidism and see what diet changes, if any, someone with this condition should look at making. Hypothyroidism is a condition that describes an underactive thyroid which means the gland isn't producing enough thyroid hormone. We need thyroid hormone because it plays a major role in the metabolism, growth and development of the human body and affects nearly every organ. Thyroid hormone regulates fat and carbohydrate metabolism, respiration, body temperature, brain development, cholesterol levels, the heart and nervous system, blood calcium levels, menstrual cycles, skin integrity, and even more. So you can see how many potential problems can arise if someone has hypothyroidism. There are many causes of hypothyroidism, but there is no question on just how common it is, with potentially 1 in 10 Australians demonstrating some presentation of it from a spectrum of the presence of thyroid autoantibodies in the blood right through to overt hypothyroidism. The most common cause of hypothyroidism in the Western world is Hashimoto's thyroiditis, also called Hashimoto's disease, which is an autoimmune disorder that causes chronic inflammation in the thyroid gland. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is named after the Japanese surgeon who discovered it back in 1912. Hashimoto's thyroiditis primarily affects middle-aged women, but can occur in men and women of any age and even in children. The cause of Hashimoto's disease isn't entirely known. Some scientists think a virus or bacterium might trigger the inflammatory response in the thyroid gland, while others believe there is a genetic explanation. The most common symptoms of Hashimoto's disease include weight gain, fatigue and sluggishness, feeling cold, constipation, poor memory, also called a brain fog, joint and muscle pain, and even depression. All of these symptoms are related to the function of thyroid hormone, so it is no surprise that inadequate thyroid hormone causes so many problems. Removal of the thyroid gland will also cause hypothyroidism if inadequate replacement thyroid hormone isn't taken. Radiotherapy to the head and neck area is also a cause. Then there are diseases that affect the pituitary gland that can also cause hypothyroidism. The pituitary gland is important because it releases thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH, which travels to the thyroid gland to tell it to make more thyroid hormone, and which accelerates iodine uptake into the thyroid gland. Iodine is, after all, a key mineral that is synonymous with the thyroid gland, with a deficiency of this nutrient causing goiter. If thyroid hormone levels are low, then TSH secretion is increased, so a key blood test for hypothyroidism is TSH levels. Now, back to Hashimoto's disease, considering that is the main cause of hypothyroidism. The disease process for Hashimoto's is on a spectrum, and not all people with it require treatment. Some patients have autoimmune antibodies for the thyroid gland, but retain enough thyroid function without the need for medical intervention. Once the body can no longer produce an adequate amount of thyroid hormone, thyroid replacement medication is needed to correct the hormonal imbalances linked with hypothyroidism. The principal management of hypothyroidism is by oral 
thyroid hormone replacement, usually with a drug called levothyroxine. In the body, levothyroxine is converted to active thyroid hormone. Diet is important in managing hypothyroidism, but diet alone is not a cure for hypothyroidism. And a side note here, if you're taking levothyroxine, it should be taken between meals, as some foods, and potentially even coffee, can reduce its absorption, as to can calcium and iron supplements. And interestingly, lactose intolerance, which is actually more common in people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, can actually increase the need for more thyroxine medication. So that is something to be aware of. Left unmanaged or not taking enough thyroid hormone medication, hypothyroidism can lead to numerous health problems, such as weight gain, fatigue, poor memory, and hair loss. So hypothyroidism, whether clinically diagnosed or perhaps even subclinical, where it hasn't been fully detected yet, gets a lot of blame for many health problems. Because weight gain is a common issue with hypothyroidism because of thyroid hormones' direct impact on metabolism, a range of calorie-restricted diets are often tried. But before even addressing weight gain, the number one priority is to get the thyroid disease under control. And this is the role of your doctor, through blood tests and appropriate medical treatments where needed. Weight changes are very unlikely to happen before all of this is under control. Now, this podcast does not have the magic answer for long-term weight loss success and sustainability. And anyone claiming they have the solution is selling you bullshit. All diets, no matter what their claims, work by either restricting the volume of food you eat, the time you eat, or restrict one of the major macronutrients of either fat or carbohydrate. That's it. Every diet ever promoted in the history of humankind falls into one or more of these three categories, no matter how much they may dress up the rationale with lots of sciencey sounding language. Losing weight and keeping it off is hard, and it is just as hard, perhaps even more difficult, if hypothyroidism is a confounding issue. In the world of weight loss for hypothyroidism, the ever popular low carb diet is one that pops up consistently. But a word of caution here, that there is some research to show that when taken to the level of a ketogenic diet, it can impact on thyroid hormone levels by limiting the conversion of thyroxine to the active form of thyroid hormone called triiodothyronine or T3 for short. A similar situation is seen during prolonged fasting, which makes sense as a decline in metabolism is a survival adaptive response to the lack of food. And as a ketogenic diet mimics some aspects of starvation, then it may not be so favorable for thyroid hormone levels. The complete opposite of what someone with hypothyroidism wants to see. There's a really nice article about low-carb, keto, and hypothyroidism written by dietitian Joe Leach, which summarizes all of this really well. So I'm going to link to this in the show notes if you want to read up more. Another element that will pop up for anyone delving into the world of diet and hypothyroidism is gluten. Certainly in celiac disease, the response to gluten is a classic autoimmune response. But it has been proposed that even non-celiac gluten sensitivity could be a trigger for hypothyroidism. I should add that non-celiac gluten sensitivity is a vexed issue, whether it is a real condition or just a collection of symptoms that have some overlap with celiac disease but aren't related. You can learn more about this area by checking out my podcast episode number 53 on celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity for the full summary of this field. Because Hashimoto's disease is also an autoimmune disease, could there be a link with gluten if the gluten could also trigger an autoimmune response in some people? There is some overlap with the presence of thyroid antibodies and the presence of celiac disease, so it can't be discounted completely. Some studies find that a gluten-free diet 
can reduce thyroid antibodies, but other studies find no benefit. And certainly some people have reported significant weight loss simply by switching to a gluten-free diet. But people have reported weight loss on every single diet ever promoted. So these are just anecdotes. The summary here is that if you've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, then it may be worth considering getting tested for celiac disease rather than just adopting a gluten-free diet, which has far more to it than just cutting out bread and pasta. But at this stage, gluten can't be entirely ruled out as having a link with Hashimoto's disease. But it is unlikely to be a major contributor in most cases. And that should be clear from the demographics of Hashimoto's, in that women are far, far more likely to develop it than men. So that can't be explained just by gluten consumption. And I couldn't do a podcast about hypothyroidism without mention of iodine. Iodine is a vital nutrient in the body and essential to thyroid function, seeing as it is made up of iodine after all. While autoimmune disease is the primary cause of thyroid dysfunction and hypothyroidism, iodine deficiency is a key cause of it worldwide. A severe iodine deficiency during pregnancy causes extreme and irreversible mental and physical retardation, known as cretinism. Cretinism affects approximately 6 million people worldwide and can be averted by the early diagnosis and treatment of maternal iodine deficiency. And a worldwide effort to provide iodine salt to people living in iodine deficient areas is ongoing. It's also why iodine has been added to salt as part of mandatory food fortification in Australia. Another point that comes up when learning about hypothyroidism and what role diet can play are things called goitrogens. Goitrogens are substances that interfere with the uptake of iodine into the thyroid, and they can exacerbate iodine deficiency. Foods high in goitrogens include soy, cassava, and cruciferous vegetables, such as cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower. For people who have adequate iodine intakes and eat a variety of foods, the consumption of reasonable amounts of foods containing goitrogens is of zero concern. Although science is yet to clearly define what a reasonable amount here is. So it is more an issue if you have iodine deficiency or are at risk of it and have a diet low in iodine that you may not want to not go overboard with these types of goitrogen foods. And when it comes to thyroid function, soy often comes up as being a food to avoid for anyone with hypothyroidism. At least, that is what the internet will tell you. Soy does contain goitrogens, but a review of 14 studies in healthy adults and people with hypothyroidism found little to no effect of soy foods or isoflavone supplements on a range of measures of thyroid function and I'll link to this study in the show notes. Still, the authors did state that there does remain a theoretical concern based on cell culture and animal studies that in people with compromised thyroid function or low levels of iodine consumption, that soy foods may increase the risk of developing clinical hypothyroidism. But just whether they should avoid soy foods altogether or just limit them is unclear. But since this review came out, two long-term randomized controlled trials have been published, both of which involve women taking isoflavone supplements. And of course, isoflavones are very high in soy foods. Neither study found any significant effect of the isoflavones on thyroid hormone concentrations, TSH levels, or thyroid antibody concentrations. So for anyone with thyroid problems, don't get your diet advice from what you read on the internet from wellness blogs and the like, especially if it is prefaced by alarmist claims about soy and other goitrogen foods that have little basis in scientific fact. And especially with the case of Hashimoto's disease, where the underlying cause really has nothing to do with iodine deficiency, there really is little need to go on a restrictive goitrogen avoidant diet. 
And the final nutrient I'm going to cover is selenium. Selenium is found in very high quantities in the thyroid gland because it's required for the formation of enzymes that regulate thyroid hormone metabolism. Given its crucial role, some think that selenium levels could influence the development of Hashimoto's disease. But this claim is controversial because a specific mechanism has not been discovered. A meta-analysis of randomized placebo-controlled studies, which I'll link to in the show notes, has shown benefits of selenium supplementation on both thyroid antibody levels and mood in people with Hashimoto's. But the effect seems to be greatest in those with a selenium deficiency to start with, which perhaps is not so surprising. And a follow-up review to this study published in Cochrane Reviews also found mixed evidence to either support or refute the use of selenium supplements in people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. A word of warning, selenium is not a nutrient to just dose yourself up on without good reason, as too much of it can cause gastrointestinal problems and nervous system problems. And there have even been cases of death from taking supraphysiologic amounts of it. Good food sources of selenium include Brazil nuts, seafood, meats, and whole grains. So let's wrap this up. There really isn't some kind of standout hypothyroid diet that would be recommended for someone with Hashimoto's outside the core of broad healthy eating guidelines. That can be tweaked if there is a greater reason to focus on more foods containing selenium or iodine or perhaps trialing a period on a gluten-free diet for a time. Weight loss and maintaining it is difficult for anyone, regardless if there is an underlying medical condition, such as Hashimoto's, or not. The two best predictors of success here are sticking to the dietary changes that connect with a person and getting ongoing help, support, and advice. Be wary of dogmatic advice that weight loss is only possible on low-carb, low-GI, paleo, intermittent fasting, or any number of other popular diets. There is no best diet for weight loss, and there is no best diet for weight loss when someone has hypothyroidism. That doesn't mean that someone with Hashimoto's shouldn't be open to trying different eating styles until they find one that makes them feel better. But the cornerstone of the management for hypothyroidism rests with your doctor and someone like a dietitian to get tailored nutrition and lifestyle advice. Not from dubious advice from the internet that makes promises of miraculous results for curing hypothyroidism just by hacking your diet. So that's it for today's show. You can find the show notes either in the app you're listening to this podcast on if it supports it, or else head over to my webpage at thinkingnutrition.com and click on the podcast section to find this episode to read the show notes. If you find this podcast of value, then please consider sharing it with your friends and colleagues, or maybe even leave a review. This all helps increase the ranking and reach of the podcast, which means a big win for credible evidence-based nutrition messages while helping to dilute out the crazy and making the world a slightly less confusing place. I'm Tim Crow, and you've been listening to Thinking Nutrition. Thank you.